Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God's kingdom now and forever. Ngala gadich nungamort, gen gadak nijabuja. We acknowledge the Nunga people as the original custodians of this land. The Lord be with you. Sisters and brothers in Christ, God sent his Son among us to reveal wisdom and to make known God's ways. We come today seeking to increase our faith, that we might confess Jesus as the Son of God, take up his work on earth, and trust in his promises that sustain the Church. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, confident in God's forgiveness. Merciful God, Almighty God, who has promised forgiveness to all who turn to him in faith, pardon you and set you free from all your sins, strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord.
Let us pray. O God, fount of all wisdom, in the humble witness of the Apostle Peter, you have shown the foundation of our faith. Give us the light of your Spirit, that recognizing in Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of the living God, we may be living stones for the building up of your holy church. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book Exodus. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them or they will increase and in the event of war, Join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Pithom and Ramesses, for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread, so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed on them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Puah, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and you see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, that the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every boy that is born to the Hebrews, you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrews' children, she said. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, 
Shall I go and get you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child and nurse it for me and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and she took him as her son. She named him Moses because, she said, I drew him out of the water. Hear the word of the Lord. been on our side, now may Israel say, if the Lord himself had not been on our side, when men rose up against us, they had swallowed us up quick, when they were so wrathfully displeased at us. Yea, the waters had drowned us, and the stream had gone over our soul. The deep waters of the proud had gone even over our soul. But praised be the Lord, who hath not given us over for a prey unto their teeth. Our soul is escaped, even as a bird out of the snare of the fowler. The snare is broken, and we are delivered. I have standeth in the name of the Lord, who hath made heaven and earth. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. <clears throat> I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy, in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. Hear the word of the Lord.
Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my Rock and Redeemer. Amen. The story of Moses in the bulrushes is a favourite from childhood. It is a story of averted disaster, almost fairy tale like in its twists and turns the salvation of a baby through the actions of a clever and resourceful mother and a sympathetic princess. The tale of the royal upbringing of a child who would have to change sides to reveal his true identity. This baby has been chosen by God to lead his people out of slavery and oppression and into a life and nationhood blessed by divine law. The Gospel of Matthew casts Jesus as the new Moses, the one chosen from birth to fulfil the law. So it is fitting today that we hear together the story of the baby Moses and the moment when Peter recognises Jesus as the Messiah. For the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is the Moses figure that the people of Israel have been waiting for. The one who will deliver them once more out of slavery and into freedom. And although Matthew points to the similarities between Moses and Jesus, it seems to me that Moses and Peter have much in common. Moses, just like Peter, has moments of complete brain fade, doubt, impetuousness and fear. But both are blessed with divine revelation. Moses' moment happens in Midian, where he has fled after killing an Egyptian. 
God is revealed to Moses in the burning bush and Moses learns how God will act through him. Moses is chosen, like Peter, to be the leader who will form and guide the community of God, who will bear witness to God in the world. The moment between Jesus and Peter in our Gospel today should raise the hairs on the backs of our necks. This is Peter's burning bush moment. This is the moment when Peter sees Jesus as no one else has seen him, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus' response to Peter's declaration is a clear indication of the immensity, the profoundness of the moment. In Peter's words, the truth is revealed. And Peter reveals in himself the leader that Jesus has seen from the beginning. Jesus will act through Peter, just as God acted through Moses. I can imagine the crackling of the fire, the voice of God in those words. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you stand is holy ground. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And then, in just a few following verses, the moment is gone. And Peter is being slightly more ordinary, doing something impulsive, a bit stupid, in rebuking Jesus and telling him he is not allowed to die. And then Jesus is calling Peter Satan, and the rock has become a stumbling block. Hearing Jesus refer to Peter as Satan, soon after he has declared him the foundation of the church is shocking. But if we have paid any attention to the way Peter responds to Jesus throughout the gospel, we shouldn't be surprised. This, after all, is the disciple who jumps out of a boat to try his luck at walking on water, only to be brought down by his own fear. This is the disciple who, when faced with the transfigured Jesus and the prophets Moses and Elijah, suggests he pitched some tents for them. This is the disciple who rashly declares he will never deny Jesus, but rather will follow him bravely to death. This is the disciple who falls asleep when Jesus asks him to stay awake. And this is the disciple who, when confronted, denies even knowing his Lord and Saviour. Not once, but three times. Peter is impetuous. Peter talks a big game but does not always deliver. Peter has doubt. Not the sort of foundation one would think to build a church on. What Peter Jesus sees in that foundation of the church moment is not immediately obvious to those of us who have compiled a litany of his shortcomings. But it is not Peter's failing that Jesus dwells on. It is rather his willingness, in response to the revelation of the divine, to give everything, to risk everything, in order to bear witness to and follow Jesus. Paul, in his letter to the Romans, exhorts the church to do similar. Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Peter may look foolish sometimes. He might need correction, teaching, patience. But Peter belongs to Jesus, mind, body and soul. With his action, perfect and imperfect, Peter proclaims the truth as he knows it. He has found the Messiah, and his life will be forever changed, forever a testament to this truth. When Peter answers Jesus, I see you, you are the Messiah, Jesus responds in kind, I see you too. 
and the transformation that I will work in you will provide the foundation of a church that will withstand the very gates of Hades. I want to tell you that the transformation Peter undergoes is complete and perfect in the death and resurrection of Jesus. But the journey of a disciple is a marathon, not a sprint. Moses' trans transformation took place over a 40 year long trek. Peter's story continues in the Acts of the Apostles. But this transformation that is offered in the death and resurrection of Christ is ours to claim also. And as church, as the body of Christ, we offer ourselves up to be changed profoundly and permanently. As the body of Christ, we respond to the revelation of the Messiah with our own declaration of dedication and commitment, to finding our place in the kingdom, to fulfilling the call that Jesus has placed on our lives. We might be prophets. We might be leaders, teachers, givers, encouragers. We all have a place. And as disciples proclaiming our Messiah, there is a prophetic word waiting for each and every one of us. Moses and Peter stand in testament to a God who will speak and act through lives that are as human and flawed as any one of ours. Our moment most likely will be different. But whether we are plucked out of the water in a basket as helpless babies or leap out of boats as adults, God will act with us and through us. God is ready to catch us when we call for help, ready to forgive us when we get it wrong, and ready to speak prophetic words into and through our lives from the moment we proclaim Jesus as Messiah. When we offer our lives to Jesus, when we journey with the persistence of Moses, when we respond with the proclamation of Peter, we are gathered and transformed into Christ's church built on the rock. And the very gates of Hades will not prevail against us. Amen. Let us together affirm the faith of the Church. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and came truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church, 
We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Let us pray to the Lord, Lord, in your mercy. For the peace that comes from God alone, for the unity of all peoples, and for our salvation. Lord, in your mercy. For the Church of Christ, for K, our Archbishop, for a strong foundation and a faithful body, for retired clergy and for all who work and worship here, for those who seek sanctuary within these walls, for the safety of the builders as they work here through the week, for swiftness of progress and the skill of their hands, and for the whole people of God, Lord, in your mercy. For the nations of the world, for frontline workers in all countries, for postal workers, delivery drivers and couriers, for the whole human family struggling against the blight of the coronavirus pandemic, especially in countries experiencing a second wave, and all places hit hard by the virus. For the people of Mali, caught up in a military coup, for those thrust into economic uncertainty, and those who make political decisions, for Elizabeth our Queen and for all in authority, Lord in your mercy. For this city and its community of rich and poor, proud and meek, for peace and our shared life together, and for our neighbours, our family and our friends, Lord in your mercy. For the good earth which God has given us, for renewable resources, clean water and sustainable food sources, and for a life lived in balance with nature, Lord in your mercy. For asylum seekers and political prisoners, for the unemployed and the destitute, for the missing and the forgotten, and for all who advocate for them, Lord, in your mercy. For the aged and infirm, for the widowed and orphans, for the sick and suffering, for Angela, Ron, Ross, Kevin, Valerie, Lynn and Pat, and for all in any need, Lord, in your mercy. For the dying, for those who mourn, especially for Helen Edmonds, recently departed, and the year's mind of George Appleton, Archbishop, Tony Nichols, Bishop, Ada Waite, John Jansen, and for all the faithful whom we entrust to the Lord in hope, as we look forward to the day when we share the fullness of the resurrection. Lord, in your mercy. Rejoicing in the communion of Blessed Virgin Mary, George the Martyr, and of all the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another and all our life to God. Almighty God, you have promised to hear our prayers. Grant that what we have asked in faith, we may by your grace receive, through Jesus Christ our Lord. We are the body of Christ. The peace of the Lord be always with you.
praise you, faithful God, always and everywhere. For with your only begotten Son and life-giving Spirit, you are the one true God from everlasting to everlasting. At the dawn of time you wrought from nothing a universe of beauty and splendor, bringing light from darkness and order from chaos. You formed us male and female in your image and endowed us with creative power. We turned away from you but you did not abandon us. You called us by name and searched us out, making a covenant of mercy, giving the law and teaching justice by the prophets. And so we praise you, joining with your faithful people of every time and place singing the eternal song. When the fullness of time was come, you sent your Son to be born of Mary. Bright image of your glory, he learnt obedience to you in all things, even to death on a cross. 
breaking the power of evil, freeing us from sin and putting death to flight. You raised him from death, exalting him to glory, and the new day dawned. On the night he was betrayed, your son Jesus Christ shared food with his friends, his companions on the way, when at table he took bread. Blessed and broke it, and giving it to them said, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. He took a cup of wine, and giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, living God, as we obey his command, we remember his life of obedience to you, his suffering and death, his resurrection and exaltation, and his promise to be with us forever. With this bread and this cup, we celebrate his saving death until he comes. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Except we pray our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, and send your Holy Spirit upon us and our celebration, that all who eat and drink at this table may be strengthened by Christ's body and blood to serve you in the world. As one body and one holy people, may we proclaim the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ our Lord, through him, with him, and in him. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory is yours, eternal God, now and forever. As our Saviour Christ has taught us, we are confident to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. As this broken bread was once many grains, which have been gathered together and made one bread, so may your church be gathered from the ends of the earth into your kingdom.
the gifts of God for the people of God. Come, let us take this holy sacrament of the body and blood of Christ in remembrance that he died for us and feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Living God, in this holy meal, you fill us with new hope. May the power of your love, which we have known in word and sacrament, continue your saving work among us. Give us courage for our pilgrimage and bring us to the joys you promise. Most loving God, you send us into the world you love. Give us grace to go thankfully and with courage in the power of your spirit. We normally do presentations in the hall, but since we don't, aren't doing hospitality after the service, uh, we're going to do it in the service this morning. And uh, Jonty is uh, one of our lay clerks and is about to leave us. Uh, so we wanted to mark this occasion and uh, give, him, give him our blessing. I'm just going to ask our Master of Music, to Dr Nolan, to say a few words. Thank you, Mr Dean. It's a very bittersweet morning. Uh, we lose John T, who I shall miss, craning my neck up and looking at him, and he's always there. Um, he's such a fine musician, as you can tell, he just exudes intelligence. He's won a Monash scholarship, uh, which are not easy to get hold of. He had a choice to go to the Paris Conservatoire, but he's not going there. He's going to The Hague to study Baroque flute and a master's. So you can imagine how much we're going to miss him. Uh, you can often wonder as well about the low rumbling noises that you can hear in the cathedral. It's either the organ pedal or it's Jonty's low notes. Uh, but in all seriousness, uh, Jonty, we're going to miss you an enormous amount. He's very popular with the choir and uh, we hope you'll come back at Christmas, if you can get in. <laughs> we'll just ask Jonty to say a few words. Um. Thank you so much, um, Chris, for your kind words, uh, and thank you also, Dr. Nolan. Um, I have just learned an extraordinary amount um, in this choir, and so much of that um, is down to your efforts, Dr. Nolan, so a huge thank you to you. There's no way um, that I would be the musician that I am today without this place and without these people um, behind the grate there. Um, this it isn't just a collection of singers, it's also a family, so I'm going to miss them a whole awful lot. Um, and I'm really going to miss making um, the extraordinary wealth of music um, that you get to hear here every week. Um, and also thank you to all of you, thank you to the um, whole cathedral community. Um, I've always felt completely uh, supported um, and, and loved by, um, by all of you and, and thank you so much for supporting the choir. It's really a very extraordinary thing, so thank you. And just to finish, uh, we have a present from the cathedral and from uh, the lay clerks. So if we could give Johnsy one more round of applause, that'd be wonderful. Johnsy, Johnsy. We're going to send you with a prayer. Oh God, you are our keeper and helper. Bless Jonty as he follows his calling into the world. We thank you that you go before him and behind him, above him, below him and beside him. When in times of need or difficulty, may you provide him with the help of others and the assurance of your eternal presence. May he be a blessing to those to whom you send him and know the joy of serving you in the loving reign of God. And Jonty, may God, our creator, protect you always. God, our Redeemer, keep you from all evil. God, our Sanctifier, set a fire of inspiration within you. May God, the Holy Trinity, protect you and bless you wherever you travel. Amen.
the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of God.